All right, well, I hope you still have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 11. If not, please turn there with me. Or if you have an electronic Bible, turn on your Bible to Acts chapter 11. Uh, it's God's Word wherever we find it, on your phone or in a book. So we're thankful for God's Word. So how, should, how do Christian, Christians relate to one another today? Or maybe another way of putting it would be, how should God's people relate to one another? How should we get along? How should we relate? How do you handle yourself when you're in a, a, a deacon and elders meeting and it starts to get heated? How do you handle yourself? How do you handle yourself when you're, in, when you're at home and there's a strong disagreement between the members of the family and voices start to go up? Maybe someone joins the church and you know you don't like that person. It's God's family. How do we all get along? Now, as you look at the book of Acts, one way you can know what's important in the book of Acts is by the amount of space that Luke has given to a topic. Now, on that day, as you know, uh, it was written on, on a scroll, and scrolls were awkward, and they were hard to work with, and the average scroll in that day was 35 feet long. And space was valuable, so they would run the words together. You just have to figure out on your own where one word stopped and another one starts. But they were about 35 feet long, and it just so happens that that's the exact length that's needed to contain the book of Acts. Luke had one scroll. Now, he had a lot of material. A lot of material, and he had to pick and choose what to put in his book and what to leave out. What's important? What's less important? He repeats the story of Cornelius. He gives it to us two times. Now, was he right to do that? Was he wrong to do that? Was, was it the right thing? I think it was. Yes. Because many in that day thought that Christianity was to be a branch of the Jewish church. All of the early believers were Jews. Their background was Jewish. Their history was Jewish. It just made sense to them that this new Christian church should be a part of the Jewish church. Made sense to them. Well, Luke sees this event that we're looking at now as a turning point, a major turning point in the history of the church. So we're going to see a couple of things. We're going to see how being prejudiced can influence us. Peter is asked to defend himself for, because he took the gospel to the Gentiles. Can you imagine that? Peter, explain yourself. Why did you take the gospel to a group known as the Gentiles, the non-Jews? That's most of us here. That's you. That's me. I came across, across a quote that I liked. It's from a man named Charles Morrison. He said, the Christian church is the only society in the world in which membership is based upon the qualification that the candidate shall be unworthy of membership. <laughs> and that's true. It's the only organization. What, why are you qualified to be in the church? I'm not qualified. Jesus is. Amen. Come on in. That's not the way you join the Y or some other group like that. So really, we're picking this story up in the middle. We, we looked at it a few weeks ago, then we had a detour for Easter, and now we're going back to Peter, and Peter's defending himself. The scholars call this Peter's defense, and I want to look today at the pieces of evidence that Peter uses to defend himself. So the first evidence used by Peter is in verses 5 and 6. He said, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. An object coming down like a great sheet, lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze on it and was observing it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beast and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. So Peter said, let me tell you about it. Let me tell you what happened. And folks, he goes into details. Now, I'm married. And I'm kind of slow sometimes, but I have learned over the years that and I don't know if all women are like this, but I know the one that I'm supposed to know is like this. She wants details. Details, details. So, guys, if you want to get along, learn this lesson. Details. So, 
How was how was work today? Fine. Uh uh-uh. uh. Nope. What'd you do today? Oh, typical stuff. That's not what they want. They want details. How would work today? When here at nine o'clock, I ran into this problem at ten. Here was how I handled it. Um, um, that's what they want. They want details. And that's what Peter does here. He gives the guys details. He said, this is what happened to me. Now, none of us really like change. And I know change is hard. But whatever change we're dealing with, it cannot contradict the Bible. Whatever, whatever area of your life, your home, your family, school, work, whatever it may be, it cannot contradict the Bible. The change should line up with Scripture, whatever that change is. Now, there's some lessons we see in Peter that we can use in our, in our own uh, uh, living and how we're going to handle life. What do we see Peter doing back before we got to this point? Peter was praying. Do you remember that? We found Peter praying. The second thing He was having a Bible study. He was having, if you wanted to use our terms, we would say he was having his daily devotions. So he's praying, he's having his daily devotions, and then guess what? Circumstances started to change. It started to change, and circumstances started to fall into place. So maybe in your life, you're, you're, maybe you're thinking, Lord, what's going on here? What's going on in my life, Lord? Well, are you praying? Are you reading your Bible? Are you having some type of daily study and time with the Lord alone? The Lord used that in Peter's life to then change the circumstances in Peter's life. Now, verses 7 through 17, Peter's focus is on the Lord's leading. Let's read verses 7 and 8. He's continuing with with the details. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. So Peter retells his story, and as he tells it, he's still amazed. He was there, but he's, he's still amazed as he talks about it. So let's summarize a little bit. In verse 7, get up and eat. Verse 9, what God has declared no longer unclean cannot be unclean. God can change the rules. He won't change the moral rules, but he can change the rules. Verse 12, the Spirit told me to go and to go without questioning. Verse 15, the Holy Spirit fell on them just like he fell upon us. Then verse 17, God gave the same gift to them that he gave to us. All right, now let's break it down. Verse 9, let's look at 9. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unclean. Peter, the days of clean and unclean are over. Now that just haps, that has to just blow his mind. Because we're talking about centuries of teaching. In Ezra's time, the Jews were forbidden to mix with the Gentiles in marriage. But because of Christ's blood, the Gentiles now have a clear path to God. Romans 15, Revelation 22. So that's the message to Peter. All right, verse 10. This happened three times. And everything was drawn back up into the sky. Now, three times. It's, it's not luck or chance that it happened three times. There's a theme going on here. God did it three times. Now, God required three witnesses for something to, to be established as true. Three witnesses. And this is a revolutionary vision that's going on here. The diet laws controlled everything that the Jews did in their entire life. So I can hear the men in Jerusalem. Are we going to change something this important because of the witness of one man, even if it's Peter? Now, verse 11. And behold, at that moment, how many men? 
three men appeared at the house in which we were staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Three men, three, vis three visitors. Now, the second piece of evidence that Peter uses is the witness of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 12. The Spirit told me to go with them without misgiving. These six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house. So I took these six believers with me. That's seven people now. Now, Egyptian law at the time required seven witnesses and seven seals to make a document and mark it as real. So here are the facts. Here are the seven witnesses. Facts and witnesses. The case for Christianity, folks, rests on its facts. Christianity is a religion of facts. Now, there's two things that we want to emphasize here. First of all, God could have given the gospel to Cornelius through an angel. That would have been very moving and very impressive. But no, God said, I'm going to reach Cornelius by the leading apostle himself. Peter. Number two, before the Gentiles were brought in, now this is important, before they were brought in, Cornelius' prayers were accepted by God as a Gentile. His prayers were accepted. He is obeying the Old Testament, the Bible that he has at the time. All right, let's go to verse 13 to 14. And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. So I can hear Cornelius now. Peter, it happened right there. That's where the angel was. I saw the angel. The angel talked to me. I'm a military man. I've seen a lot of things, but I've never in my life seen anything like that. That's what happened. Verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. So Peter's preaching. He said, guys, the Holy Spirit cut me off. I wasn't finished yet. I had a five point outline. I was two and a half. I was on point number two. Now, now this is kind of funny because Jesus was cut off by Peter a lot. Peter would cut Jesus off a lot. Now Peter himself is being cut off. He said, I still had points left on my sermon. Hey, guys, it wasn't my idea for this to happen. Now, they don't know it, but this is the beginning. The church, the church is about to take a giant leap forward. Gospel of John, chapter one, verse five. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Next piece of evidence. Number three. We have the witness of the words of Jesus. Now, we put a lot of emphasis on the last few weeks on the words of Jesus. So look at verse 16. And I remembered the word of the Lord. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, to cause the words of Christ to come back to you so that you do remember when you need them. Verse 16, I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Peter said, I remember. Now, folks, that is a good thing. That is a good idea. All of us need to remember the words of the Lord but we're not going to remember them unless we know them or we're spending time in God's word. Now, if you're getting older and you're losing your memory and you can't remember like you used to, that's OK. You just pray and tell the Lord that, but say, Lord, I'm going to be in your word and I trust you to help me remember and recall the words when I need them. So Peter starts telling the men what was going through his mind. He goes back to Pentecost to find an example of what happened in Cornelius' house. Now, we were sitting here and we're saying, okay, this is chapter 11. That was chapter 2. But for these men, for these people, that was a long time ago. So one thing we learned here is the baptism by the Holy Spirit was not something that just happened every day, even in the early church. 
And Cornelius received the Holy Spirit when he trusted in Jesus for his salvation. And folks, that's the pattern for us today. So Peter ends his defense with the Bible. He ends it with God's word. The Bible, the words of Jesus are now going to confirm God's will for Peter's life and for the church. And that's how we find God's word. We find it. We find God's will in God's word as we as we walk through it. So let's summarize again. First of all, after praying. After reading his Bible, after obeying circumstances started to fall into place for Peter. Remember, Peter doesn't have a New Testament like you do. He remembered what Jesus has said, and you and I can do the very same thing. The words of Jesus changed his thinking. And that should be the way it works in your life and my life. So as you roll into verse 17, I want to ask this question. What is a Christian? What is a Christian? How would you define a Christian? Verses 17 and 18 are going to help us on this. So verse 17, Peter said, Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. So they believe in Jesus. In verse 18, they repent. Repentance. Now, repentance leads to life. A Christian is one who repents. And it's not something where you're going to a Catholic priest in a confession box every six months. Repentance should mark a Christian. A Christian should be known for repenting. And not just on a monthly basis with a priest. You're confessing, you're repenting to your high priest. And it'd be something that's done on a regular basis. Daily, hourly, minute by minute. As something comes into your life and the Lord brings something and puts it on your mind. So now Peter says he's going to throw it back to them. He's going to take that ball. He's going to throw it back to them and say, are you guys going to argue with what God did? Are you guys going to disagree with God? If you're against this, you're against God. Who am I to stop the work of the Lord? God did it. That's it. And the Jews have no answer for Peter. So look at how Peter handles criticism he gets it when he least expects it he didn't lose his temper he gets it when he least expects it he gets criticism and criticized when he doesn't deserve it he's criticized when he himself couldn't understand completely what was going on but he trusted the lord and the job that the lord had given him to do he trusted the experience that God brought into his life. One man said this, the Jews have been checkmated by the Holy Spirit. I thought that was pretty good. The Jews have been checkmated by the Holy Spirit. So we look at Peter, we look at the witnesses, we look at the facts. Now this is our pattern today. This is what we should be doing today. Look at verse 18. Again, when they heard this, they quieted down, glorified God, saying, well, then God has granted the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Now, the first part of this, they, when they heard this, they quieted down. That is what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to spend some time on this. Your job and my job is to shut the mouth of the unbeliever. Our job is not to convert someone. We can't do that. Only God can change a heart. Our job is to shut the mouth of the unbeliever. Take their argument out of their hand so that they can't lean on it. That's where we're going. That's, the, that's where we're going to spend our time tonight. They quieted down. They, and these are not unbelievers. I'm just applying it to the unbeliever. These are believers. Now they quieted down. They held their peace. The critics have to be quiet. So for the moment, this group is silent. 
Now, we're going to see the critics again in chapter 15. They're going, to, they're going to rise again after they start to see a large group of Gentiles coming to the church to the point that the Gentiles could take over the church. There's more Gentiles than Jews. We're going to see this group. They're going to, have, they're going to choke big time again. But for now, they are silent, but they will protest again later on. And let's give them credit for quieting down and accepting the evidence. They glorified God. So for now, they're glorifying God. Now, the word repentance means a changed mind that leads to a changed life. A changed mind that leads to a changed life. So when you're dealing with someone that claims to be a believer, and you can't judge a heart, neither can I. But if you don't see a changed life, and if that changed life has not led to repentance and a changed mind, both of them going together, you have reason to have some questions. Is that person a believer if the repentance hasn't changed their mind and then changed their life? It should, we should turn from ourselves to the Lord. Turning from ourselves to the Lord. So there's no doubt repentance is a part of salvation. So after it's all over, the Jews now drop their charge against Peter and they glorify God together. But like I say, the church will have to deal with this issue again once and for all in chapter 15. But we see an immediate acceptance here. Now, that's a good sign, too. It's an immediate acceptance, but it's not going to completely solve the problem. So, yes, we'll give them some credit. They heard the evidence and they offered no more objection. So for the moment. The issue is settled. Now, Paul's going to fully deal with this in Ephesians 2 and 3. You can go home and, and read that on your own. But there's still a bit of a mystery that's going on in the minds of the believers here. And that's what Paul's going to deal with in Ephesians. He talks about that. But the believers are, are now accepting this, but they're uneasy. They're, they're uneasy about having the Gentiles in the church. So what do Gentiles have to do to become a Christian? What do they have to do? They have to believe in Jesus, what he has done for them, and nothing more. So now this is what God's plan is from that moment on for the rest of history. To bring people into the church from every tribe and nation on the world. All right, let's move to some application. What did we see? We, pe we saw Peter praying and then God directed him he prayed and god directed him we can learn three or four lessons from this number one things change things change they always change it happens when i was when i was back working in the workaday world and as you know now i only work on sunday but back in those days when i would work five and six days a week i won't name the company or where i was or what i was doing but there was a big emphasis, probably 35 years ago, there was a big emphasis on planning for retirement. Oh, and it would show this, these older couples, or they'd be so happy, and they've got gray hair, and the guy's losing his hair, but they're, they're so happy and smiling because they, they planned well, and here they are now, they're in Paris or someplace, and they're just enjoying retirement, and that's what you need to do. You need to plan now for your retirement, and that's, that's wise. But the reality was, there were many, many people that I worked with, and I, I can think, I could give you names. A guy would retire, six months later to have a stroke. He'd be flat on his back for the rest of his life. Or someone would get cancer, and their life would be changed forever. Or someone would have a heart attack and die two years after they retired. That's life. That's the real world. But at the same time, we do need to prepare, don't we? But it may not be all roses and cookies like some of the brochures that we would hand out to people. Things change. Life happens. We plan for retirement. We plan for this. We plan for that. But God may have other plans. Technology has changed the world. Technology has changed the church. We're holding, many of you are, 
holding your Bible on a phone. Many churches have screens up with God's Word on it and songs, the words of the songs, and screens are fine. That's great. There's nothing wrong with the screen. It's change. There's nothing right or wrong about that change. Culture is changing the church, but the church should be changing the culture. Now, that is a problem. The problem is the culture is changing the church, and the church is not changing the culture. And that's something we'll be talking about on Sunday night as well. Second lesson we can learn. Whenever there's a change, it, re it involves some kind of adjustment on our part. You and I have to adjust to something. COVID. COVID required major adjustments. We shut down. I don't remember how many weeks we shut down, but at some point the elders said, enough of that. We open. We said, we don't, we don't know if people will come. They may stay at home. We don't know. But we're going to open. They can come if they want to. We're going to be here. COVID required some changes. And some of the things that changed in COVID have not gone back. They're still the same the way they were then. How are you doing in adjusting to change in your life? School, family, job, church, whatever it may be. How are you doing in adjusting to the change that's taking place there? Next, we all know change can be uncomfortable. That doesn't mean it's wrong. Doesn't mean it's right. But change can be uncomfortable. Next, every change that we make in any area of our life, home, school, church, family, whatever it may be, should be done in light of the Bible. The Bible should be the guiding light that all of our change has to go through. I'll give you some examples. Now, some of you are old enough to remember this. If you're not, just learn, learn as a, it's a history lesson for you, okay? Back in the late 60s, early 70s, guys started wearing their hair down to their shoulders. Sometimes a little bit longer. Oh, my goodness. You would have thought the world was going to end. I just wish I had some hair that I could grow down to. But the church, oh, many, many churches had a big problem with that. Many of the parents had a big problem with that. Is that really where we want to draw a line? What does the Bible have to say? Does the Bible say that men cannot have long hair? How about music? Music started to change. The late 60s, well, actually late 50s, moving into the 60s, music started to get a beat. And people started moving with it. Oh, my goodness, that's terrible. Is there anything in the Bible that says music can't have a beat? Or that I can't move with some music? Don't think so. Today, rap music. Now, personally, I don't care for rap. But is, it, is rap music right or wrong? No. It's the words. What do the words have to say? The words are how you analyze music. So what do we learn from that? Some things can change. Some things cannot change. The doctrine of justification by justification by faith will not change but how we present that doctrine may change from time to time we need to be somewhat flexible in what we do i uh, came upon a list and this is uh this is out of uh, swindoll's commentary he said here are some things that cannot change for me if i'm going to a church these things cannot change so this is his list the inerrancy of scripture the deity of Christ, his virgin birth, his sinlessness, his atonement on the cross for sin of humanity, his bodily resurrection from the grave, his literal return to this earth, the fulfillment of his promises, the assignment of those without Christ to hell, and the assignment of those in Christ to heaven. So that's his list. And you know what that is? He just came up with a confession. He just came up with a creed. That is his creed. A creed is something that you stick to. It's the foundation. And I've had people criticize the leadership here because we hold to the Westminster Confession and the larger and shorter catechism, which are the constitutional documents of the Presbyterian Church. 
Now, some people misunderstand. They're not on the same level with the Bible. It's written by men, but it's written by men who are scholars and gave their life to those documents, and we need to appreciate those. We don't look at them as, as if they're without error as we would look at the Bible. There's no error in the Bible. Those documents can have error, but they've had hundreds and hundreds of years to be examined to find the errors that might be there. If you're talking to a, an unbeliever and the unbeliever asks you, hey, what, what's, the, what's the Bible have to say? Now, you could just hand them a Bible and say, go home and read it. Are they going to do that? Probably not. At least they might read a chapter or two. Probably not going to read the whole thing. Or you could hand them the Westminster Confession, the larger, shorter catechisms, and say, here, this is a summary of what the Bible has to say. It's a summary of what the Bible teaches. They may read that. So things change. So today, how do you react when someone criticizes you? Now, if you're in leadership, prepare to be attacked. If God calls you to be a deacon, you need to prepare because the devil's coming after you and he's coming after your family. Because if the devil can destroy your family, he can destroy your ministry and your witness. So when you say, I'm willing to be a deacon, I'm willing to be an elder, you better get ready for attack because it's coming. And that's why we need each other. We need to be open with one another. Hey, I'm, I'm being tempted in this area. I'm being hit here. Pray for me here. Pray for me there. How do you handle criticism when, it, when someone criticizes you? You want to ask yourself, is there, if there's any truth in it, is there any truth in this charge? If there is, change. If it's not true, keep going. Move on. What criticism was raised against Peter? How did he handle it? What can you learn from the charges leveled against Peter and how Peter handled it? Peter's a great example here. We're not dealing with the Peter in the Gospels who had all the answers and had an attitude and was going to fix everything. This man's starting to grow. We're starting to see sanctification in this man. And it's, it's thrilling and it's going to get even better when we move into 1 Peter and 2 Peter. There you're going to be dealing with a senior citizen statesman of the church and apostle. So what can we learn from how Peter handled criticism? Peter tried to teach those who criticized him. He calmly tried to teach those who criticized him. I want to close with uh, something I found in the uh, in Kent Hughes commentary on this section. You know the name Gandhi, who was in India, did a lot of good work in India. He writes, uh, was, he quotes Gandhi. Gandhi said, I like the New Testament. I like your Christianity, but I do not like your Christians. Wow. And sad, sadly, folks, too many times that's true. The unbeliever might say, I like the New Testament. I like your Christianity, but I do not like your Christians. So what kind of a how do you handle criticism? Do you raise your voice? You make, make sure that you're yelling louder than the other guys yelling. I had an experience like that. I was an elder in a bigger church, and as a, there was a guy that, if I said it was white, he would say it's red, you know, all the time. And so we were, we were debating something that was important to me, which was music. And I was standing up, and, and I didn't realize it. But I must have been raising my voice or something like that. And he said to me, I see that you're a lot like me. That you lose your temper or whatever it may be. I don't remember exactly what he said. But when he said that it, it shocked me. And I immediately came back. And from that moment on, I only debated the issues calmly. I made sure I did not raise my voice. I didn't do anything. So it, it can happen. It can happen to the best of us. But Gandhi's statement is striking. I like the New Testament. I like your Christianity, but I do not like your Christians. And then Kent Hughes closes. The gospel never changes, but we can become unchangeable, inflexible, and thus unusable. What are our attitudes towards others? Exclusive? 
passive, concerned, hopeful, actively loving. We need to regularly consider Peter's vision and its meaning and implications for us today. So that's our challenge. That's what we can learn from this. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for this passage that you chose to include in the book of Acts two times. So, Lord, you're telling us this is important. You want us to be reading this, studying this. What can we learn? Thank you for Peter and the growth that we see taking place in him in this passage. We followed this man a long way, Lord. And I'm so thankful that my whole life story isn't in the Bible where someone could read it because it wouldn't be pretty. But we thank you for raising Peter and causing him to grow in sanctification in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you do the same thing in our lives this day, this week, we pray in Jesus name. Amen.